media he moment. covers your story, your story will be covered from the ground up. All right, so look, this next guest, I've been trying to get on my show for I don't know how many years now, and I don't know why she hasn't been here, but she's an amazing actress and somebody who's singing half of the girls at home that sound like karaoke singers down. Please welcome Amber Riley. Hello. Amber Riley. Well, welcome. What took you so long to get here? Oh my God, Jason, I was scared. Why? You have a way of getting the tea out of everyone. Really? I didn't want my tea spilled. You know what I love is that people come on the show. First of all, I think there's this perception out there that, that, that like I'm the big bad wolf and for some I am. But <laughs> but for my friends, I find like some people are just, they're not uncomfortable of what I'm going to say or do. They're uncomfortable with getting comfortable. Because mm. once you get comfortable, once those guards come down, it's almost like, you know, the altar. They just be laying all their sins right in front of me. Yeah, you might be right. But I you don't know. have tea. Do you have tea? I don't I mean, like, yeah, but probably wouldn't be exciting to the masses. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so you're born in Compton. Yes, I'm now, in Compton. Now, this is the thing I didn't know about you because you've had a, an amazing career of success in what I will coin as um, Laverne Cox educating us on white fame because you came into the game mm -hmm. embraced by mainstream. You got white famous right out the gate, but you come from Compton, which I would have never thought. I would have said maybe like, maybe Pasadena. <laughs> No. You thought I was from the Dina? No, I mean, because you're because every time I see you, you have a smile on your face, you're always happy, you're always positive, you're never in no mess. I never hear anything. And I don't know if that's just good coaching, but if you're from Compton, <laughs> there has to be something there. So how was it being raised in Compton? I mean, honestly, I, I attribute a lot of um, my upbringing to my parents. It's like, it's almost like my parents knew that I was going to be a star growing up. And I, I think I got like, training pretty early on um, um, from my parents. But I mean, I grew up in the hood. Like, I think I saw like my first dead body at eight years old. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've seen people overdose, you know, I've been in drive-bys before. Like, I really did grow up in the hood. And then I had cousins that was like, you're the one that's not hanging out with us. You're, you're gonna make it. So like, you can't go to the parties and you're not allowed to, you know? They kind of, my family kind of protected me from all of that. But do you have siblings or no? Yes, I have two older sisters. And so when you were growing up and you were in the midst of all of that, and there's, I'll start making connections. The first person I seen killed, I was eight years old mm -hmm. as well. And I think and now that I'm in my process of doing therapy and talking to my therapist, there's people like us that have gone through things where the ex expectation of us is that we don't make it to be successful or mm -hmm. positive. So when you were going through that at a young age, how did you... how did you find normalcy in your community when what you were seeing around you was not normal? Man, I feel like it felt normal until I got older mm -hmm. because those are things that everyone around me was seeing too. You know, you grow up hearing, if you grow up hearing gunshots every night, you're not going to flinch. Right. Like that's just, that, that, that's when just. When you don't hear the gunshots, you're, you're like, like, what, what happened? happened? Exactly. The quiet that I, when I finally moved out the hood, the quiet actually scared me because I was always looking for the noise. Wait, so your parents were together? Yes, my and they're still together. Were, no, my parents aren't together anymore, but they were together pretty much my whole entire childhood. So you had a normal, uh, what what a normal upbringing would look like. Yeah, I mean, for for the most part, we did move a lot. Like you know, I didn't grow up having money. Uh, um, you know, we we kind of moved from place to place wherever you know we can live. I did grow up with you know my parents kind of fighting and separating and getting back together. Um, so all of that was like. That was a lot. And therapy has, like you said, therapy really helped me realize, oh, that stuff really did affect me. Mm -hmm. Like more than I, I, I thought that it did. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of a normal upbringing. <laughs> Wait, so did you, when you were growing up with your parents, because I literally have never seen my parents together, mm -hmm. like, in ter like never staying together for a day. So when you saw it, when you were with your parents, did what was their relationship? What, did they like each other? Did, were they there as a way? Because sometimes we stay with people because the rent is due. Yeah. You know, what I mean. Um, but were they there? Were they together in love, or what was the relationship? I think they 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 loved each other. Um, I, I think my parents got married kind of kind of young, um, and maybe I think you know. There's like this. We've we've made like separating or uncoupling kind of an abnormal. 
And I think they got to a point where they kind of just chose themselves, you know what I'm saying? And um, but they did it when I was an adult, so it didn't really it didn't really affect me as much. Mm-hmm. But growing up watching them, they pretty much, you know, they pretty much love each other. They fought, but try not to fight in front of us. Mm. But, you know, kids are a way, they pay attention way more right. than we think that they do. Right. So, like, I always knew when my parents was on the house. Like, I was, I was nosy, too. <laughs> but did you like one more than the other? Because I was a mama's boy, I guess, because I was only with my mom. Mm. But were you? did you like one more than the other? And Because I, I always wondered if I was... If I had my dad in my life, would I be different than I am today? I don't know the answer to that, but were you closer to one than the other? Um, I was close to my dad, I think, growing up because my mom was hard on me. But when I got older, I realized why my mother was so hard on me. And now she's my best friend. Mm. See, that's funny. This morning I woke up watching uh, the conversation Michelle Obama had with Winnie Harlow, Kelly Rowland, mm-hmm. Tina Knowles. Did you see that mm-hmm. at all? I saw, I saw a little bit of and it. And Angie Martinez. And she was talking about... Um, Kelly Rowland was basically saying like she wants to be her kid's friend Mm -hmm. and Michelle Obama was saying you do not want to be your kid's friend because (laughs) your kids need to be able to hear what they need to hear from you before they go and hear from the world. So do you think your mother was intentional in being a mom Mm -hmm. when you were being raised instead of being your friend? I think so. I I also think like I'm the splitting image of my mother. I act like my mom. I look like my mom. And I think my mom is also a singer and she was in the industry. So I feel like my mom saw herself in me and was like, I'm going to rear you in the right direction so that you make it to where Mm -hmm. you are. And, you know, some things that, you know, there were some things that I think she did that was that when I was younger that hurt. But my mom and me, as we got older, have been able to have those conversations because she was like, I don't want to make the same mistakes with my grandkids. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to make sure that I'm doing the right things, you know, with her because she's really creative also. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I think that she was a she was focused on being a mom and and putting me in the right like on the right path because she just she said it herself. Like, I always knew that you were going to be here. So what, at what age did you, because my understanding from what I heard is you didn't want to call my show because you had, you were, you had anxiety mm-hmm. about what the experience was going to be. And so I know that you've been in, in therapy. How long have you been in therapy now? Uh, five years. So in five years, has anxiety been something that you were working on? Yes. Where did the anxiety come from? Oh, man. Um, I think my anxiety, I've I've had it since I was a kid. I had this people pleasing thing. You know, when my parents did fight, I was the one that was trying to entertain everyone and get everybody to get along. You know, I never wanted my parents to separate. Um, I think uh, us kind of going through financial troubles and not knowing if you were going to be staying in the same place for a very long time, like that made me really anxious. And I kind of took on a lot of those responsibilities that nobody asked me to. Um, and then when you get, I got older and I get on a TV show and you start making all this money, but nobody's ever to- taught you how to manage money. Nobody's ever taught you how to manage fame. You know, I always thought that I was pretty normal growing up. And then you get on television, everybody's telling you you're fat. Everybody's telling you you're too big. They're telling you you're ugly. So then I was anxious. Then I got anxiety about my own looks and how to present myself to the world. So. It's a lot of like worrying because anxiety sometimes is about like worrying about the future. Um, And uh, I really think Hollywood really (laughs) made it a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Um, Anxiety and depression for me a lot worse um, to the point where I was like, I was forced to get help. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think I would have stayed here if I if I didn't get help. Mm -hmm. So was it so when you so in terms of your career, let us back up before the career, before we saw you on Glee and all the different things that have followed that. Was the anxiety as bad as it was? Or did you have it? You had anxiety. Yes. Okay. But, but I it, didn't but know it was anxiety. It amplified once you got yes. in front of the public. Mm-hmm. Were you one were you the type of person like I used to be and watch everything said on social media? And yes. then did you did you invest <laughs> in what people were saying about you? Yes. Really? Because you realize you have to realize like Twitter became a thing when I became famous. Right. Like Twitter literally became a thing when Glee started. We were required to get Twitter accounts and live tweet during the show. And your fans were rabid, so they're like online all day. So, so when we would see you in Glee doing the Glee thing and being amazing and, and and just singing like crazy, you were still getting hate then. Yes. Was it hate from white people or black people or both? White people. Really? For sure. Um, I think blackness is so um, intimidating, and I am black. 
Like you not looking at me and being like, what should I mix with? I wonder. I'm black. Like there's 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 no wondering, you know what I'm saying? And it, at that point, that's not something that I understood. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't understand. I just felt like, oh, I don't belong. I don't belong here as opposed to. But you felt that because the fans were saying you didn't belong there. I think fa the fans, I felt like even on the show, like I, I, I was, my gift was always being utilized because I could sing. Right. But they didn't invest in me as an actor. Like my, my character never got It's Just Do. Mm -hmm. Um. And that made me feel like I'm only valuable doing one thing, coming in at the end of a song and belting, you know what I'm saying? Or saving it, as, as some people would say. And then, and because of that, like, they always, you know, always pitting you against the, the main character and seemingly winning, but never really getting your, you know, never really getting your shot. Those kind of things, like, that affected me. I internalized those things and it made it, it made it really hard for me to encourage myself or really see myself. How many seasons were you on Glee? Six. And you, okay, because I know recently one of the actresses from Euphoria, she left the show. She was a main staple of the show mm -hmm. who felt like her character hadn't evolved and that they weren't allowing her to evolve. And I'm like, how do you walk away from a successful show? You're like in all the conversations, the biggest show on, on TV or streamers. Yeah. Why did you decide to stay instead of leaving? Oh, because I, I, it was a check. Right. Like, uh, 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 <laughs> no, honestly, like in my mind, I got to a point where it's like, this is this show wasn't created for you. This is not your shot. You'll get your shot, but this is not your sh shot. So look at it as a job. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what it is. I come in, I do my job, I go home. That's what it became for me. Do you think it's the white privilege of knowing you can find another show or find another job or just what? Because we hear a lot of conversations right now from black actresses that talk about lack of opportunity. Yeah. So for a white woman or a woman who's not a woman of color, they can decide, I'm just going to leave because I'll garden until I get another job because it's coming. Yeah. Whereas we know that those opportunities aren't out there as much. Yeah. I mean, like I've, 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 I've been in the industry uh, a, a pretty long time and the show that I was on should have opened doors for other, other shows. You know what I'm saying? And um, I have to remind myself. And you know, my team reminds me like, hey, you're you're Amber Riley and you've paid your dues in some ways. And there's stuff that I auditioned for that I feel like I should not have to audition right. for still. And other black actresses have said this and it made me feel like I'm not crazy. I'm constantly having to prove myself. It doesn't matter what I've done in my career, I constantly have to prove what myself. What do you think that is? I, I I think it's a I think it's uh an issue with with Hollywood and black actors. I don't think that they value us. Um, in Hollywood um, as much as they do uh, white actors. And uh, I don't think that there's as many opportunities for black actors. Like, I don't think that they think, you know, black film and black television is mainstream when, when it is. Same thing in music. You know, R&B is mainstream. You know, R&B is pop. It's popular music. But don't you think it's more popular to, to the purse holders and the decision makers when white people sing it? Um... I think they put more money behind white people. Seeing. Which is what I mean. Yeah, I yeah. think they put more money. Therefore, they have a, a wider reach. Um, I don't think that it's. Uh, I don't think it's more popular than when a black artist sings it. Um, I'm not speaking to us yeah. because I feel like we own R and B. That's yeah. ours, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I feel like R and B is not more important mm -hmm. to the industry decision makers mm -hmm. until white people are singing. Yeah, because meaning mainstream press isn't going to really run it unless oh, yeah. a white person singing it. Meaning labels aren't going to put the amount of money or budget into videos or mm -hmm. the touring that they would unless a white person is singing it. Yeah, honest, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I I I think everybody kind of knows that. Like that's not even. They're not even shy about it. <laughs> but why aren't they mad about it? Why aren't, why aren't, why aren't? I feel like our people aren't mad enough about that. That's a, that's a question that I can't even answer because it's something that I really don't understand. And I think, I think it has a, a lot to do with producers and writers. You know, they want to buy our music, but they don't want to put money behind our music. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had songs that I've, I've written and executives come in and like, oh, I can hear so-and-so singing this or I can hear this other person, you know, singing it. And I'm just like, but I'm singing it. Like, y'all don't want, you love the song. You don't want to like, you know, put money behind it for me to do a music video or, right. you know, something like that. Like, that's just, that's the nature of the business. 
So when you were on Glee and the show was coming to a wrap and you knew that it was over, what did you expect to happen after that show and after all that success? Honestly, I didn't know. I, I honestly was like, the show's ending and I don't I don't have a plan. Like mm -hmm. it's not, it's not um it, like I said, there just aren't as many opportunities for black actors. And it took a long time for me to even be welcome in black spaces. Because, because you had the white famous. I was white famous mm -hmm. to everyone, but I'm like, no, I'm black, like I'm black, black. Like I'm So black. so were any of the black girls <laughs> were any of the black girls that we know in the industry mean to you? No, I really haven't experienced that. You haven't. Um I've I've really had more of them reach out. I've really had I've really had a lot of love from from black actors, honestly. Um, I mean, I'm from LA, so most of my friends are just friends that I've had for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of people in in the industry that I can I consider actual friends. So who are your celebrity friends? Um, Gabourey Sidibe is a good friend of mine. Ashley Blaine Featherson, Logan Loris, like. Uh, Chica's a good friend of mine. Um, I mean, I have I have like my industry friends, and I, I I talk to them on a on a level of like we really really know each other. Mm -hmm. Like those are my actual homegirls. Do you think singing and being able to sing as good as you can was ever a barrier to success as an actress? Whew, yes, I feel like sometimes singers that can really 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 sing aren't for. The masses, the masses won't, the masses tend to gravitate toward what they can understand. And sometimes what they can understand might be a little more mediocre. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's the reason that there are so many amazing vocalists that don't get the shine that they should. But then you think back, one of the best movies was The Bodyguard with Whitney Houston, who was mm -hmm. the best singer in the world, and she was able to do both. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was a generational thing, like a time where social media now, once we see you sing and perform, you are a singer, and it's hard to switch into the thoughts of you acting and singing. Yeah, I think I think streaming has a lot to do with it. I think social media had a lot to do with it. I think we are we are just uh, bombarded with so much at one time, um, and I think it's just it's it's been easier for for people that know how to just get people's attention to kind of break through. Back then, like, stars were made back then. Like, Winnie Houston was made. She had a producer that came along that focused in on, in on her. There was more of an made, investment. There's no investment. It's literally factory now. Mm -hmm. you know? Who can have the best TikTok hit? That's, I kind of feel like that's ruined music, though. I mean, when I, I, you know, no shade to the people who are doing it now, and I know a lot of you, and I see a lot of you at the parties, and I dance to one of your songs, and then I move on to the next song. It's almost like there's no album that, I'm, that I've gotten in a while that I've said this entire album is something that I want to invest all of my time into. And I don't know if that's the digital download, if that's mm -hmm. just social media or what that is. But I feel like, it, like TikTok, these platforms that we all rely on is ruined music. <laughs> Because, I mean, I forgot the artist's name. What was the artist's name? Halsey. Halsey. Oh, Hal Halsey. Hal Halsey. Halsey. Girl, we didn't go to TikTok. That's why we didn't see your name. Halsey. Halsey. Yeah, she spoke out about the fact that they wanted her to have a TikTok song for it to even be like a thing. Yeah, I've, I saw a couple of artists make videos about that. I'm not with a label, so I do what I want. But <laughs> And independence is a level of freedom. Independence is a level of freedom. But that is, woo, <laughs> baby, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. It is draining. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Today has drained me. Okay, yeah. so so let's go back to singing. So you and Jennifer Hudson, I know you were recently on the show. Something yeah. that you two share in common is you both lost American Idol. Well, mm -hmm. she, she well, you didn't even get to go. <laughs> I didn't even get on but there. she went all the way and lost. <laughs> yes. What what with your experience with American Idol? So we didn't even get to see you. Mm -mm. No, and I did. And you were the, singing like this then? Yeah, I did the I did the like. You know how they have like all the producer rounds. Like right. you don't people think you just get your number and you go and sing you sang for like Simon and all that. No. You have the producer rounds and then you get in you get in that way. I think it's like three rounds of producers before you even get to Simon. So when you got there and you got rejected, what did that feel like? Like my world had ended. Really? Like yeah, oh my God. We had driven all the way to San Francisco. My my mom, my dad, and my sister. It was freezing cold. Um, waited 
hours and hours and hours just to be seen. And it was like an immediate no. And I was like, immediate? excuse me. <laughs> Wait, but did they hear did they hear you sing? Yeah. Yeah. I sang um, I think I sang Sweet Thing by Shaka Khan. And they were just like, we're gonna pass. And I was just like, I was devastated. Like I've never, I cried. I think I cried that whole drive home. Really? Wait, so then when, cause there's a lot of people I know, even like me, when I get rejected, see, I'm a little more cockier though. Cause I'd be like, yo, I know I'm, I know I'm <laughs> like, y'all just late. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I won't lie and say there's never been a moment where I've been like, damn, you know, right. like a little let down, but I yeah. always feel this, there's this thing in me where I'm, where the media, as soon as they say no, it just makes me go harder. Yeah. So when, when you felt that, when you felt defeated, how long did it take for you to regain the confidence to try again? I mean, I think, uh, I want to say like years, honestly. Really? Yeah. So you took the rejection and actually believed in it? I mean, I think that wasn't just one rejection. That was rejection after rejection. Like, oh my God, I finally have a really big opportunity. And it was just like, I need to take a beat. <laughs> So how long was the break between that and the next try? Um, I feel like a couple of years. I started singing at, um, a couple of years after that, I started doing open mics again. And I actually started singing at Mike, um, Mike's Magic, what is it? Magic Club, Magic Mike's Club or whatever in Hermosa, Hermosa Beach. Jay Leno used to, uh, does comedy there every Sunday, mm -hmm. and they started a music segment. And the guy heard me sing somewhere that owned it, Mike, and he asked me to come down and do like a little residency. So that was like my first taste of like, oh my God, I'm getting paid like weekly to come and sing and entertain people. Um, and that was really dope. But it was just grinding after that. Like I sang in the smallest <laughs> bars. Like you can hear the toilet flush. Right while I was singing on stage. Like the the bathroom was right there. Did that did that bother your ego? No. No. It never made me feel I just wanted to sing. Yeah. It excited me every time I got to sing somewhere. I'm still that way. Mm. I love singing. I know you've sang at a couple of our things. I mean every time we have something live I'll be like, y'all can y'all call Amber. Cause I feel like people have to see the gift. And it's mm -hmm. it's you know, we go I go to a lot of things and again the views expressed on this show belong to me. I will never forget, I went. <laughs> Everybody's like, he's elevated. There's so much cappuccino. Like, I'm still chasing. Like, I remember one time I was at an event at the Palladium and I was, I forgot what it was, the Maxim party. And I'm sitting here and Tiana Taylor, who's a phenomenal performer and singer and all that's right here. And there's just everybody's kind of like spread, sprinkled throughout. And I remember they were like, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Nashe. And she walked out on stage in some Adidas tennis shoes and she was dancing her life off, but the, the notes were just not there. And I was just thinking like, <laughs> what is happening? Because I love real singers. Like if you ain't singing from your gut, if you're, yeah. not, if you're not trying to evoke an emotion in me that I cannot stop thinking about you, I, I cannot watch you. Yeah. And I feel like you're one of those people that no matter where you are, no matter with the venue, whether it's Instagram, because you know I'm gonna ask you to sing something in a minute. Um, <laughs> it's 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 just memorable. Why do you think people do not see you for that? Um, I think they're starting to. One one, I think that I had to believe it in myself, and that's something that I'm really really working on. And I think it's I'm I'm getting to that place where I'm relentless now. Mm -hmm. Like I know what I what it is that I have, and it's not just a voice, like I'm an artist and I know that I have, I, I know what this world is missing and I feel like I have it. Mm -hmm. And I think now that I've grabbed hold, uh, a hold of that, people will see it more. Um, but you have to be relentless. I feel like Lizzo was relentless. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 I feel like she's such a great example of, I'm gonna be myself and I really don't care what it is that you have to say. Um, and she still doesn't care what she had to say because she's shining. She won an Emmy. She just she won just another won what? Grammy. What she win? She won uh, album of the best year. Best record of the year. Record, record of the year. year. Yeah. Record of the year. Which is huge. Yeah. I mean, she was the first black woman since Whitney Houston. Yeah. To win that. And yeah, and that was a very long time ago. So you said on when you talked about um, Glee and the body shamers back in two thousand uh, December two thousand twenty two, you said I suffered so much through my time on Glee with people always having an opinion about my body, like my body was always a topic of conversation. 
it was a war zone for such a long time for people to pick over online. Mm -hmm. When you see them doing that to Lizzo and you seeing her continue to push through, I mean, we honored her at the Hollywood Unlock Impact Awards for the Fear Fearlessness Award because she's demonstrated vulnerability and fear fearlessness. When you see what she's gone through, do you connect to that? And if so, do you pull from her strength to keep pushing? I do. I really, I do connect with it. And I, I think I pull more from every time I, I see her opening an award show. And it's all these women that look like me, that look like her, that may not be a mainstream body type, you know, because even me, I'm a curvier, even though I may be bigger than the average, I'm still curvier. I have a little bit more privilege in that, in that community, the plus size community. But she has women that don't have that have pear shapes and apple shapes and like all these different body shapes and all these different shades. And when I see them shining because they can dance their off, when I see her background singer singing their off, her singing and dancing and being a, a freaking pop star, like that the way that it empowers me is it ain't just because she's big, it's because she's phenomenal right right and it's possible but also i think she pushes through and embraces it yes. and 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 exudes a certain level of confidence like even when i was at my heaviest i didn't embrace it even though everybody could see it mm -hmm. I, I was in delusion though because i still thought i was cute like i was cute <laughs> and i was still sliding in dms that i had no business being in <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I said recently, like, you know, <laughs> I used to be really mad at the guys for not sliding back. But when I think about where I was at, like, my confidence was just on a 10. Yeah. You've lost weight now. Mm -hmm. But did you did you lack the confidence to embrace it because of what people were saying online? Yes and no. I always knew that I was beautiful. I always knew that I was dope. I just didn't think the rest of the world felt that way. Right. And that's a that's tough because as much as people try to make it seem like there's some island and other people's opinions don't matter, in some way they do. Mm -hmm. It's the reason that it's part of the reason that we you know present ourselves in a certain way because we do care, you know, in, in some way. So yes and yes and no. I wouldn't be here if I didn't you know didn't think that I was. Did you ever have people around you though that would shake you and be like, "Nah, like you're good"? Or did you have a support system? Oh yeah, you did. yeah. My sisters and my my mom and dad are for sure my my support system. Like, no, you tripping? Like, you you're you're good. Like my friends. Like I have a really good, I have a really great tribe, um, and I've been very careful about who's close to me, and especially now, like. Uh, there has to be reciprocity and, and 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 there has to be health in my friendships and my and my relationships. So I've always had people that have been like really encouraging and like pushing me forward. Mm -hmm. You said earlier when you were when we were talking about mental health or talking about um, therapy that you said um, you, you referenced something about not being here or not making it. Was there a time where you ever felt suicidal or you? F yeah. yeah, I dealt with I dealt with suicide as a kid. Um, I just didn't feel worthy or worth it and I, that was more like a colorism thing because I was darker and I just I always felt like I always focused on my talent and entertaining people but not myself mm -hmm. you know I didn't feel like people accepted me who as who I was I felt like I make them laugh or I can make them cry when I sing or they want me to come and sing here or you know people would invite me to parties because I was funny and like I can talk to all the people and like it was almost like I was the entertainment but I never felt like people really the masses really, really saw me and it, it was very isolating and, and very lonely. And um, I remember at, a, this is like a really, this is a dark story, but it's, it's almost funny at the same time. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Go Let me, hold on. Let me get the laugh out because I just had Claudia Jordan here and she was talking about having adopting a kid and she said she won't adopt kids because Jeffrey Dahmers are out there and I laughed and people what? had a moment online. So let me get out. Okay. Wait. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. What does she mean by that? Wait, no, 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 no. Next question. No. Okay. So when I was like, I was about 11 years old, I found these bag of pills and I took all, all of them thinking I was like, you know, I saw it on TV. So like I had taken all these pills. All of a sudden, like my stomach was hurting. They were diuretic. So you know what? That was God literally getting your together. Yeah, literally. I had never been on the toilet so long in my whole entire life. Okay, well, we can see, laugh. We messed, can laugh at that. That messed my stomach. 
So I didn't know what I took. I didn't know what it took. So when you did that, and did you laugh at yourself after? The, like, was it a was mm-hmm. it like a God just God just it laughed? It really at you? was. It was like okay, because you know, in those in those moments, they're just they're very dark, hopeless moments. But you come out of them, yeah. and I think that that always stuck with me. Like yeah. that was a dark moment, but look, I I came out of it, and I'm I can literally laugh about that now. But the courage it takes to even want to take yourself out, I don't have that. I don't know if it's courage, though. I think it's... I, I mean... I, I know, but I think, it's, I think it's desperation. I think it's extreme pain. I, don't, I wouldn't even say it's courage. Mm. So then when you fast forward, you, you get denied um, American Idol. They don't even let you. That's American Idol. Y'all slept on her. And then they slept on J-Hud, too. And look at all the success mm-hmm. she's had. Which is just, I think those are moments where like you go to Glee, you get that. So you look back at the rejection and go. A Fox show. Right. It's a Fox show. The same network. Mm-hmm. So then you kind of, does, does that validate you though? Like, did you feel validated? Absolutely. You have to pay me to sing now. Now I'm not singing. No. <laughs> right. Now I'm not singing for free. And you're not driving all the way to San Francisco to do it. That part. <laughs> okay. So then you're the first person to win Dancing with the Stars and Mass Singer. Yes. Y'all can clap it up. I got it. So you're the first to win both. Um, Mass Singer, I knew that was you, though. You did? Yeah, abso- absolutely. Yeah, I know your voice. Worst, it was the worst kept secret. Kind people, of do, do you think people knew? Because people yes. online were like, Amber Riley, Amber Riley. People knew. They, yeah. was, they was laying me out online like, so you really going to sit here and act like it's not and you? Then you kept acting, and you kept going about your daily business like it wasn't? Mm-hmm. Liar. <laughs> so when you're doing Mass Singer, my understanding is, because Wendy told me the story about how they put her on the jet, they covered her up. Like, nobody else who's on the show gets to know who else is on the show, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. you didn't even know who the other competitors were? No idea. But you didn't care? No. Because you treated them all like Tanache. You knew that you were going to go and out-sing them, out-perform them, out-harp them and everything, right? I mean, for me, I I do love competition, though. Like, I I love healthy competition. Like, I wanted to go and sing and do the best that I could do. But honestly, in that moment, I was kind of over the industry when I actually did it. Because I actually filmed that last July. Oh, wow. And I kind of was just in this, at this point like, is this going to happen? Like, God, what are we doing at this point? Because I feel like I've, I've done things. My, my career has moved forward. I've proven myself in this way. I've proven myself in that way. What do I have to do to prove that... This is what I'm supposed to be yeah, doing yeah, and get yeah. people to pay That attention. this was his assignment. And Mass Singer did, it really did do that for me. Did it? It did. So how many kids did Nick Cannon have during the taping of that season? <laughs> I think he had two. I'm not being funny, but I think he had two. I mean, Nick, was there a nursery backstage? When you walking through the harp, do you see, like, are you playing for the babies? Like, what's happening? Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I didn't see. I didn't see any no. of his children. So... <laughs> What did you, how do you like that show? The show looks fun. It is so much fun. It really is so much fun. Like I, I, now honestly, I had one of the easier costumes. Like some of them, the, some of those costumes look like <laughs> I would have been upset the whole right, time right. that I was there. But me, for me, like my costume was pretty easy. I loved working with everyone. Everyone on the set was super nice. Um, the judges said like such amazing, amazing things, you know, and for them to be my peers, like it, it really meant a lot, and I think that there there were things that they said that I needed to hear. What what was that? You know, your your gift is great. You have something. Oh, just know, reaffirming. To, it was just really it was really reaffirming, and I felt like I needed to hear that from people that I actually admired. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like Robin Thicke's album, A Beautiful World, Cherry Blue Skies. Like his first album is one of my very f- favorite albums. Like nonstop, he's mm-hmm. in my like top ten. So hearing some a songwriter like that saying those things uh, about me as a singer and Nicole Scherzinger, who I think is has one of the best voices, you know, hearing her say what she said and them being, you know, near tears, like it was really re- reaffirming. So what do you do to prepare to go out on a stage like that where, you know, everybody's watching it, it's a lot of pressure, mm-hmm. it's as big as American Idol where you were rejected. Mm-hmm. What are you, what is the mental preparation for that? I had to really breathe. Cause I was nervous every single time. Were you? Yeah, one, I didn't want to fall on my face in front of everybody. Right. And heart, heart, heart fall off the stage. Heart, like, yeah. That would have been a moment. <laughs> if I would have failed, that would have been a nightmare. Um, but yeah, I really had to meditate and get my mind right and focus in. Before I perform, I don't like to be around a lot of people. You'll never see me, you know, with a really big group. I'm really quiet and very into myself and really into in my head. Going through the lyrics, making sure I know, you know, the, the notes of what I rehearse, like, 
I'm super like in the zone, mm -hmm. kind of like a football player. Like I'm really in the zone. So when you were out there, was there a time where, when was the moment when you knew, okay, I'm, I probably got this? I don't know if there was a moment. Really? Yeah, because it can go, it literally can go either way. Are you in your dressing room watching the people get eliminated though? No. So, so you still don't even know we're who- We're not allowed, we're, we're not allowed to. Wait, so, so then how do they keep you all from knowing who's, you, you know when the audience finds out? So you're watching with us? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, like, I mean, if you're, like, on stage, like, I will. I won, I won every night that I was there. So I was always in the back. Uh -huh. But I would kind of, like, see. Sometimes I would see people doing their interview when I walked out. And I'm like, oh, that person, you know, was eliminated. They're unmasked. Like, and they're doing their interview. But for the most part, no. I didn't. Get to so watch. does everybody that gets the mass singer do they deserve to be there? I mean, were there in, was there anybody on your season where you're like, now you know damn well even with the mass you didn't belong here? I don't. I mean, it's a it's a competition. I think everybody deserves to be there. But everybody that's on that show is not like a singer singer. No, but I think some of it is just fun. It's for fun. Yeah, it's I think some of it is players. just fun. Yeah. I would do the mass singer, but I'm secretly a very good karaoke singer. You can see. I can hear. Absolutely. I can hear it. In your tone, Louis. I can sing, I can whistle, I can out whistle, I don't even know who. I can't whistle that well. Really? Mm -mm. <laughs> you know, back in the day, you talked, well, you talked about colorism. I remember Lettucey, who I've been trying to get here on my show. Lettucey, I think, is terrified to come on the show. <laughs> because there was that time at the, I forgot what award show, where they had her sing a song. No, they had Beyonce perform a song that was a song that she had originally sung in a film. Uh, and there was this whole thing online where people, and Lettucey didn't say anything because, you know, you know, it just, I th I think, I haven't talked to Lettucey, but I just feel like if you speak out against Beyonce, it's pretty much, you know, look at Carrie Hilson. So when you see um, that colorism, how real is that in the industry? Because I just want to provide space for, to mm -hmm. talk about that because I, I've heard it from a lot of my friends. You know, I have to now watch the words that I choose, even though in my mind I'm not colorist, but I may say something that connects to somebody's experience. Yeah. How real is it? Is it still real today? Um, yes. I, I think it I think it also has a lot to do with um uh, your features and your blackness. It's not even so much being as as dark skinned. I think it's it's more having more African like features and being like basically not being racially ambiguous mm -hmm. in, in, in any way. So I think colorism has a coloring ha has a lot to do with it. Um, it's not the only thing, but you know, there's it's intersectionality. Like even though we, we may deal with racism in the in industry and dealing with white supremacy within that, we also deal with colorism within that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and within that we also deal with homophobia within that. And within that we deal with transphobia. Yeah. Like it's, it's intersectionality. There are, a lot of things can be true and happening at the same time. Mm. And then you see a successful film like Wakanda that's killing all the records and Angela Bassett just winning, uh, you know, the Golden, Golden Globe, Globe for her role. They're the first time ever for a Marvel film. Doesn't that start to break that glass ceiling? Um, uh, I, I don't. Yeah. You could be controversial. I mean, not, not, no, it's not even being controversial. It's just, does it break a glass ceiling? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if it breaks a glass ceiling. Is it incredible and wonderful? Yes, because as we've seen, a woman king during the war, a war season didn't even get uh, you know, the nods that it should have because that, that film was absolutely incredib incredible and the first of its kind. Right, and it, I didn't hear anything about it. During the war. Why do you think you think it was the colorism thing? Yeah, I think so. I think it, I think it was colorism. I think it was sexism, seeing all these black women being strong and... Um, saving themselves in a film. And then they had a, a black director, a black female director also. So uh, I think it's, you know, it's all, it all intersects. <laughs> so we talked about um, the, the weight loss. What, what was the journey to get there? Cause mine was a trip to Houston. <laughs> What's that mean? <laughs> a trip to Houston? <laughs> I had surgery. I didn't have time to lose Period. weight. I mean, you know, like I tried. <laughs> I tried, I ran, I I ran, I ate well, I stopped drinking, I did all the, I did everything and it just wasn't working for me. So I took a trip and then I came back 22 and a half pounds lighter and every week after that I kept losing weight. But then I had to change, of course, my mm -hmm. lifestyle. But what was your process? Oh man, this is five years. When I started, when I started therapy, that's when I really started taking my health seriously. It was 
blood tests, checking your hormones. It was mm -hmm. uh, food tests to see what, you know, you're allergic to, what foods make you bloat, what foods hurt your stomach. It was, you know, changing my relationship with food because I used to feel like, oh, eating less means you lose weight. When it was actually eating more <laughs> means you lose weight, which was a mind Right, 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 right. Because right? right. <laughs> we're just... We're taught the opposite. It was not paying attention to the scale and just being consistent and showing up at the gym and cooking instead of going out to eat. Like it literally was just, I mean, there is no secret way to, to being healthy. And if you want to lose weight, there's no secret way. It's literally just discipline and consistency or surgery. And you talked about your body. You said um, to people online, falling in my DMs because I've lost weight. And you said, keep that same fat phobic energy. Because ain't nothing changed with the scale. Who was in your DMs? Did Drake Ooh, slide? Because you know Drake no. likes him thick. No. <laughs> no, you know what? It's not, it's not even famous people. It's like guys that I've known for a long time or guys that I've worked with. It's like the DMs went from hey sis to like being a little bit more <laughs> flirty. And it was weird to me. Like I've known you for a long time. And just because I, I may look a little bit different, like you don't get to hit on me now. Like that's weird, bro. Because you liked me when I was fat. But because I was fat, you didn't want to hit hit on me. Mm. I was bigger. And because society makes you feel a way about being attracted to a bigger woman, now it's okay for you to slide in my DMs. So when did you get rid of the um, fiancé? When did you get rid of the fiancé? It's a mess. I always like when I ask a question they ain't ready for it's it. And you, hear the whole, and you hear the room go, oh. <laughs> But that one wasn't coming. Yeah, I mean, because if they slide near your DMs, they know you're single. I knew you were engaged at one point. Yes. When did you get rid of we him? We broke off our engagement uh, in October of, what is it, we're 2023? Last year was 2022. In the uh, 2021, worked it out, tried to work on it, just didn't work, and then just parted ways last February. How long were you guys together, though? Um, two years. That's a long time. Yeah, a little bit over two years. And then you got engaged. We were, yeah, we got engaged like eight months in. And you thought that was the one? I did. And you were in love? I was. And this was before the weight loss journey? This was before, yeah. But while you're in your mental health experience mm -hmm. through therapy? Yeah. And then you woke up one day and decided, that's it, I'm done. No, I think, I think you know, like I said before, people, people make uncoupling or breaking up like, a failure or whatever. The time we spent together was the time that we spent together. And, you know, I can't speak for him, but for me, I can take my lessons and like move forward. It just, it just didn't work. Mm. And that was during out. COVID. Yes. So y'all got together during the pandemic? Before, right and before the And then went through that together. Pan pandemic, yeah. Did you just get tired of seeing him every day? Cause, <laughs> cause I will tell you, being with somebody in the, in the, in COVID was, that was on top of having your own stuff was like a lot. No. Not really. I mean, because we broke up after the pandemic. Like, Wait, I he feel was, like y'all was together close, through it? Yeah, I feel like we got closer during the pandemic because we he, were around each other all the time. So y'all survived millions of people around the world dying and still didn't see Don't put it in that, don't put it that way, Jason. But that's okay because I ran into you in Vegas and you had a whole nother man. You know, <laughs> we still in the cappuccino room, but I'm still Jason Lee. So that's the new man. Yeah. And you're in love with him. Yes. Look how she's smiling. I can't find anybody to make me smile like that. Uh, yes, you can. How did you meet him? Um, through my friends. Really? Actually, we met at. So we have two friends. Their birthdays are like five days apart. So they had two birthday parties. He was at the first birthday party. It's a really long story. See, he was at the first birthday we got party. Time. And we saw each other. We kind of like met outside. Um, he was helping my homeboy that was like a, a little drunk getting his Uber or whatever. We kind of chopped it up a little bit. And um, I was like, God, he is so cute. And then I saw him again a couple of days later at our other homeboy's birthday party. And he was just very like, you need a drink? And he was just like, oh, you look nice. Like, he was just really kind, you know, and attentive. And later on that night, we ended up going to a club and like my god brother was there. My god, like a bunch of my family was at this club and it was very random. And like my cousins and stuff. Perfect time for an engagement. <laughs> and he was like, I guess he was like following, like his eyes were following me. And my cousin was like, come here. And he was like, who's that guy? And I was like, oh, you know, whatever. And she goes, he hadn't taken his eyes off of you at all since you guys have been here. I was like, really? So I went up to him. I was like, my cousin said that you've been staring at me the whole time I've been here. He was like, and? Wait, you, appro you approached him? Yeah. 
What is that the Compton? What is that? I don't know. I've always been that that pretty pretty aggressive like that. And so then you guys from that point it was Yeah, I was like, Oh, I say I said, Don't play with it. Yeah, I say you my type. He was like, Say less, let's go to a bar. So we sat at the bar and literally talked the whole night. Then we went to dinner that night, like after the club. We went to Barry's and sat and talked, barely ate our food and he took me home and we sat in front of my house and talked for hours. And then we've been like You didn't have sex the first day? No. Oh, I you didn't. ain't my kind of girl. Man. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. But where, 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 okay, so you're Amber Riley. People know you. When do you know it's okay to trust, like to let the guard down? Um, I, I feel like I'm still working on vulnerability. You know, I'm an Aquarius, so right. It's very good vulnerability what sign is he? for me. He's a Sagittarius. Okay. Um, what I just had an experience with a Sagittarius. So they're good. I, yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, so far, uh, he's very set in his ways, so it's hard to get him to try new That's things. That's the Sagittarius yeah. thing. Yeah, it's hard to get him to try new things, but my Aquarius pushy <laughs> presses the issue. <laughs> Do you keep that relationship private to protect it? Um, Yes and no. Like, I'm not hiding him, you know what I'm saying? Like, I am a firm believer, like, in living out loud and being happy out loud, and, like, he makes me happy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's not like he's like my my best friend like that's my homie so I don't hide him you know he, you see him in the background videos and stuff like that yeah. so dancing with the stars when you did that um, were, you were always a dancer no really Mm-mm. so you weren't a dancer you went on there and you won what was that journey like because I don't have the I don't have the confidence to do it and if I got a three or four I would probably cuss them all out <laughs> and walk off <laughs> cuss them out. On family television. You know what? I was I was very nervous to do that show because like that was also a time where I told you like the internet was not very kind to me. So I was like, uh, I mean, it had gotten ended up getting a little bit better. But as time progressed, I started feeling like I don't want to be on this show in these skimpy little outfits and like dancing all around. Like I'm really showcasing my body at this point on that show. Now, people have to pay attention to my body right, moving. Right. I'm literally going to be a moving target if I go on here. So I said no a couple of times right. doing it. And then my, was it was it therapeutic? Yes. Uh-huh. My mom actually was like, "You should do it." And I was like, "Really? You really think I should do it?" She was like, "You should do it." She was like, "You've always loved dance. I've always loved and admired dance, but I, I was not a trained dancer." Um, and then I did it, and it was just that confidence and that sexiness came out of me. Like I had to find being sexy and not just the goofy girl. Like it was, it really helped me come into my body. So when you go out there, are you acting confident? No, I think I kind of like turn on a little Sasha Fierce, like how they right. say, you know, say Beyonce did. So it's a um, character, it's a- It's a, it's like a switch. Yeah. It's like, well, you're here now, so you better turn it. <laughs> Right. Now, yeah, I don't think I could do something like that. I, I, um, I am very confident in talking <laughs> because that's what I know how to do. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, but the idea of like acting or mm-hmm. dancing in public, like I'll give you a two step and that's all you're going to get. I feel like you if you wanted to do it, you could do it. No, <laughs> I don't have the confidence and I'm not that far in therapy yet. OK, Black Lives Matter. Um, I had I, on my last podcast, I interviewed Patrice Cullors, who's mm-hmm. been like in the news for what they said. She, I think it's a lynch, a lynching job by mainstream. Mm-hmm. But anyway, saying that she stole money. When you look at the movement of the Black Lives Matter movement and then stuff that's happening with Tyree recently murdered or just different people killed by, um, you know, white folks. Um, or police, what do you what do you make of it? Is the movement dead? Is the movement still the movement or what? I mean, uh, it's a statement. Without it being a, a movement, it's true. Black lives lives matter. Um, and it you know was definitely co-opted as an opportunity for people to seem more woke. I feel like just the phrase in itself. Um, but it's it very much so has moved from uh, Black Lives Matter to me to abolish police, you know, and um, it is shined a light on what we know as black people, you know, already in the world, the rest of the world is either opening its eyes to and can't, you know, deny anymore um, that there needs to, we need to figure out what the world needs to look like because policing is just not, it's not working. And you were active out there with the whole defund police and Black Lives Matter movement. Yes. Why was it important for you? I think you even got spat on 
Or did somebody spit on your car? A Trump yeah, supporter? somebody spit on my car. And you from Compton. Yeah, it was very hard for me not to get out. Right. <laughs> so when you look at it, like why why was it why is it important to put your face out there and be as active in the community? Um, for me, I just I started feeling like I, I have to do something. You know what I'm saying? What's the point of having this platform? What's the point of having the ears of people if you're not? And if, like everyone says, I was white famous. So if I'm going to be able to get them to, to listen or at least make you uncomfortable, at least so you have to sit and, and question what it is that you believe for a second, why not do that? So I just I felt compelled and, and, and pressed to do it, as I always do. All right. So now I've learned in having a show that when I'm interviewing people I know, because I know you, so mm -hmm. it's this is the first actual conversation we've ever had this mm -hmm. deep about you, your career and everything. But I realize that when I'm interviewing people that I know I have to ask the questions fans want to know too. Mm -hmm. Music. Yes. So you had an EP in 2020. Yes. When's the next, when's, when's the next musical project? Well, I'm working on it right now. Um, it's really good, if I do say so myself. What's the vibe? R&B. Okay. Straight up R&B. It's straight up R and B. I gotta thank I gotta thank Money Long for busting that 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 door down. Her her whole entire career and that movement with hours and hours and that whole entire project is literally thank you. I feel like she did a great job of campaigning that song, yes. even during Grammy season. Um, I was trying to meet up with her at different events, but she had so many and there was so much going on I didn't get to see her, but hopefully have her here on the show soon. But I felt like she did a really great job of putting that song in everybody's face. Yeah, and she's just a prolific writer. Yeah. Like she's she's if you know, people knew who Priscilla Renee was. She's a a hit maker. She's an incredible writer. She just finally sat down and put all that love and attention on herself and people are responding exactly mm. the way that they should. So my my project is very R&B. It will be out this year. Mm. I'm doing it with um Harmony Samuels. And yeah, it's really dope. Well, you know, another person that, I, that I, I know is phenomenal, but also underrated is PJ Morton. Oh, yeah, I love PJ. Have you ever collaborated with him? I haven't, but I, I actually know PJ. Y'all should, why, why haven't you? Because he has those live sessions. Why don't you figure that out? Like, that should be, a, you should be a part of that. I mean, PJ, stop sleeping. What is you doing? <laughs> I feel like you guys could do something phenomenal. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, like, there's a lot of artists that I really want to work with. PJ is one of them. Um, Money Long is definitely one of them. Do you them. know Money? I don't know her, but we we've, we've exchanged like DMs before. Okay. Like I sent her a message and was like, "Man, like I didn't even realize that that was you, but like, man, yeah. I'm a fan." Who else? Oh, Coco. I love Coco. She's Jones. dope. She's so dope. So who do you think is overrated? Who do I think is overrated? Yeah. This here's where here's come the black fame. As soon as you say that name, Black Twitter, <laughs> they're gonna do their job. Black Twitter is the best promotional tool in the world. I don't think I don't I don't know. You're too sweet. You ain't gonna answer it. No, I mean I don't know if there's anybody that's overrated. Like I feel like everybody has their own audience. Mm -hmm. Some just very small. <laughs> Mine is small. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Okay, so um, recently Janelle Monet, she has a new project. Have you heard it yet? I haven't. Fire. I know it is. I, I saw the clips of her playing some of her music at her release, and I'm so excited to listen. No, yeah, we were there. It's yeah. um, she ain't wearing a black and white. She ain't wearing all black no more. Period. She got color. <laughs> this is why I say I can't wait because it's an album that's you could tell is driven by sex or some type of sexual experience and the color and everything. She must be doing anything. Had when when the fans now are saying or Disney fans are asking for a Hercules remake, mm -hmm. and they and they casted you to be a part of that. Would you do it? Absolutely. Well, somebody should clap for that so Disney can make it happen. Absolutely. Yeah, I would do it. Yeah, Disney called me. Like, yes. So this, these are, again, again I'm, I'm no shade. Mm -hmm. The white fame follows you. Mm -hmm. How do we get black fans to understand the importance of supporting black talent who is embraced by white people? I don't know. You got to ask them. I mean, like I try, you know, I try my best to not only am I like in the industry, I'm a supporter of it. So like heavy supporter of it. I mean, yeah. you're, you're out here supporting everybody. It, small publications call. They want to do interviews. I try to talk to the small publications. I show up to the award shows like I'm black and I support blackness. I support black art. I support black businesses like mm. I'm black. But I think because of how I've been introduced for a long time a lot of people were just like, oh, she probably won't come or she she probably, you know, won't blah, 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 blah. 
But, you know, now I have a black publicist and I have a black manager and like we're we are being more deliberate about making sure that we are in those spaces. Is your black manager doing better than Scooter Braun? Yes. What was your relationship like with Scooter? Um, I didn't really have one with Scooter. No? That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was like, a chuckle. <laughs> that was a chuckle. I mean, I think that that was the. I mean, I think that that was the whole the whole issue. I mean, I've had a I've had a conversation with him since then. You know, really, we're good. So, how hard was the conversation? It was it was a good one because I think he you know he admitted he was like I think that I thought that I had the capacity to do what was needed for your career and I just didn't have the capacity mm. to do what was needed for your career and I thought that that was really dope of him to say that and to offer that apology. Did honestly. that validate your frustration? Um, or give you I comfort mean, in. I, closing that chapter I, I mean I just appreciated it mm -hmm. yeah I, I don't I don't it wasn't anything that I was like kind of harping harping on to be honest um because I had already moved on you know right after I left him I got the Wiz, and that was one of the best things that ever happened to my amazing. career and then I did dream girls and won an Olivier for that so like it wasn't like he stopped my career in in some way um but you know but you know, I mean I get I've only had two agencies and none of them have ever done anything for me. Like, I don't even understand why we're signing to these people. <laughs> like, is it this, because, you know, I own all this, I built all this, yeah. I did it all myself. So like, do we, do you think it's the idea that we need to have support or you just, we, we do need somebody, yeah. right? Yeah, I think it's easier yeah. sometimes, like uh, to, as long as you have the right team. Like, I love my agent. My agent is Ben Day at CAA and he's, he's incredible. Oh, wow. Like he's very involved in my career and he wants to see me do well. Um, and we have hard conversations and, you know, I was able, how come I'm not, you know, going out for any, you know, this role or that role. And he's always like, okay, if that's what you want to do, we'll, we'll figure it out. So I, I have, a, I have a really good team. Wait, who's your agent? Ben Day. Oh, well, I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. yeah. He's dope. Ben Day. He's dope. Okay. So can you sing something? Okay. Let's look. <laughs> There's an Instagram post you did. As you know, I'm a Beyonce fanatic. I'm a part of the Beehive. I know we didn't tell y'all about this on the ride over. Um, one plus one. Oh man. <clears throat> if I ain't got nothing, I got you. If I ain't got something, I don't give a damn. Cause I got it with you. I don't know much about algebra, but I know one plus one equals two. And it's me and you. That's all we'll have when the world is through. Baby, we ain't got nothing without love. Darling, you've got enough for the both of us. Listen, I think all the labels, y'all should not sign one singer who can't do that without <laughs> rehearsal. And the mic is actually on. No shade, not saying no name. They're right like, who are you about to say? Okay, well, I had to give you a gift too. Because here at the show, we give people gifts. And I was thinking like, what gift can I give her? Because you, they told me you don't want to drink. <laughs> uh, but they say that you love massages. I do love massages. Okay, so here's um, Clayton gives massages. <laughs> we couldn't rap. We couldn't rap. We clap it up for Clayton. <laughs> we couldn't. We couldn't rap him because we didn't have enough paper. <laughs> but um, Too but yes, yeah, so, paper man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have yeah. so I have some more questions. But go ahead, continue, Clayton. You're doing a great job. All right. Um, that was a nice. <laughs> This is not cheating, by the way. I have learned. Okay. <laughs> it's not cheating. I have learned. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I think that's all the questions. We'll just let you get a massage while oh, we prepare for the really games. Good. Yeah. Can we get the games? This really does feel good. That's what I'm here for. I got you. Jason's <laughs> always tight. Please stop. Please yeah. stop. Please <laughs> stop. Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Please don't even know. We ain't doing no jokes out here. Don't be playing with me. Jason's always tight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Clayton, go, get off set. Go, get off. Go, 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 go. Okay, thank you. Clap it up for Clayton. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Clayton. So now it's time to have a little fun. Now, over here, one of our games we have is called Smash or Pass. And in this game, we have a paddle. You have a paddle behind your pillow. It's literally right behind it. You feel it? There yes. it goes. Okay, but because you're in a relationship, we're gonna switch it up. Okay. Because I don't want nobody running down on me at the karaoke <laughs> night on Mondays or whatever day that is. All right. <laughs> All right, so this is the singer's edition. Okay. So we're gonna say these singers are a smash, or if their music came on, we would just pass. Okay. Okay, cool. Just be honest, okay? First one, Summer Walker. Smash. smash. Yeah. She is. She will never come on a show like this because I think she's just terrified of media, but she's dope. Yeah. She's, she gives us sad girl music and I love it. Mm. Let us be emo. Black girls can be emo. Sad girl music. Yeah. Shout out to London on the track. All right. Next artist. <laughs> That's why she's not coming, Jason. That's I, why. I love her and <laughs> London. Okay. Coming. Snow Allegra. Smash. Smash. Girl can sing. She can. Have you met her? I have not. She's super like... She gives you class. Like, I don't know. She just... Uh, I heard she's a vibe. She's a vibe. Yeah. She's a vibe. I want to do something. We should We should do like a live... We should do like a Hollywood Unlocked live. All right. Next person. Was she robbed at the Grammys? Yes. Why do they keep playing in her they face They play like in that? her face every <laughs> single year. Stop playing in her Beyonce. face. Beyonce. We're almost not even worthy at this point. Like, yeah. this is why it took five years to get an album because they keep playing with her. Yeah, I mean, like, if she didn't show up next year, I would understand. She's the only artist that can just... <laughs> she's the only artist that can drop a, an album online with an Instagram post, no caption, no visuals, and still get nine Grammys. Yeah, but, and also, like, the thing about the Grammys, like, the peers are the ones that vote. You know what I'm saying? And, like, everything, it's everything about the project. It's the producers that she decided to work with. It's the writers. It's it's how well it was mixed. Like, those transitions on that album are right. unmatched. <laughs> Do you think, but the regular person doesn't understand that? No, maybe not. Mm. I, saw, I, saw, <laughs> I, saw, I, saw, I saw a report online where they said she's too perfect. Like, so what she's supposed to, they even did like a comparison of all the other black women that won what, some award and it was like they were dressed down and they were, I'm like, are you crazy? That Beyonce person didn't have nothing else to write. And then the last slide they had of her was dressed like this. Hey, look how she dresses, what she went. I said, first of all, she looks phenomenal. Mother yes. three, got all that money. Okay, next artist, SZA. Oh, smash. SZA is another person that will not come on the show because she's terrified of <laughs> interviews. She she told me at the gym she's terrified, but she's a phenomenal artist too. Yeah, and dope writer. I want her to write for me for sure. Love it. Okay, next person, Babyface. Oh, I love his last album. You just got to get the check. What you be? What you didn't like? I love his album. Tony What's Braxton. The... She didn't get her money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but but we've forgiven him. But Babyface, I got them same glasses. I ain't forgiving them glasses. I have I bought those glasses and have not worn them. Because that big star in the middle of my forehead, <laughs> it's just, it's giving real, he looks like um, Kodak. Anyway. Jason, we supposed to be talking about his music. Okay, you know, phenomenal artist. Yes. And that album Whip that appeal. he did with the R&B girls yeah. is really dope. I'm just playing. I like you, Babyface. <laughs> okay, next artist. <laughs> Billie Eilish. Okay, it's not because, okay, but let me explain it. Let me explain it. I just never have gotten into her catalog. Really? No, I've just never gotten into her catalog. Like, I, I don't really, I know like some of the, the music and stuff that she has, and I think she's a phenomenal artist, but I don't know her music like that. Mm. So I would, hey, I would we got to pass out, we got to pass out of Amber Riley, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay, next person. Smash. Money Long. But she don't be having sex with her husband enough. We were on lip service, and her husband is fine as money. I'm saying it because he's not here, but I know when you come here, he's going to be in the kitchen, so whatever. <laughs> fine, but she talked on the podcast about not really having sex with him as much, so I wonder where the inspiration comes from. I don't know. I never met her husband. I, oh. I, th I just found out she was married. Oh, she just started posting him on her Instagram. I went to his Instagram, but I won't follow him. <laughs> All right. Next one. Jennifer Hudson. Smash. She can sing. She's one of the greatest. Yeah. Like, like her, she got bionic lungs and vocal cords. Like, I don't even understand it. Her voice don't get tired. Okay, next singer. Give oh, on. on. You're gonna yeah, smash. Is it, what is it in the middle? No, it is. It's in the middle for me because I didn't. 
I, I I haven't gotten to his catalog like that, but I do love his the voice. singles, and, and I love yeah, his voice. Yeah. Yes. And he's representing for the chocolate. He's the this generation's Tyrese. And and he has like a baritone, like a lower voice. A lot mm -hmm. of a lot of guys want to do the falsetto thing, but he sounds like I love how heavy his voice is. Okay, now you were in a movie with this next person's ex girlfriend. Oh, I love Connie. Okay, so you're just gonna be disloyal to Tiffany. <laughs> I love Tiffany too. <laughs> no, we like Common. We love Common. We love I thought Common. it was Amber Kapoor. It wasn't Amber no, no, Kapoor. <laughs> well, he, go back up to the next, yeah. go back up to, go back to the last one. That's who he date now. You didn't know that? You didn't see him backstage at the Jennifer Hudson show? No. Oh, girl. You need to start hanging around Hollywood a lot. Child, All right. I don't pay attention to nothing. I be lost. She be staying in her company <laughs> business. Okay, next. Next one. Smash. Smash. Absolute smash. I love Robin Thicke. He's been on the hustle for years, too. People mm -hmm. don't really realize, like, him growing up in L.A., even though he grew up with his father being Alan Thicke and all that, he was in these streets with, with R&B artists, like, really doing the thing. He was producing and writing before, too, and then he became, like, who he became. And he did it on his own. Yeah. Like, I love that. I admire that. And he's nice. Yeah. Okay. Next person. Now, now he said he could. He, listen, <laughs> now wait a minute. Smokey, here's some smoke. This album, Gasms? It's too much. What is happening? What's the last track on there? Fill it up? I'm going to fill it up or something like that? I just feel like I have to pass because like, if I don't, I feel like a pervert. Well, because if you he's say, like Grampy. Well, if you say Smash, given that track list, he, he might try. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a legend and icon, and he's. Yeah, he's a legend. He's given us he's given us timeless music. But he's given us a lot. I feel like from a moral standpoint, I have to. Pass. I agree. We're we're passing on you, Mr. Blue Eyes. All right. I saw him and his wife at the Clive Davis party, and they were following each other around. They're so cute. Like yeah. you could tell they've been together for a thousand years. Yeah. All right. This next game is fun. It's called Erase the Shape. Now. If you've ever bowed mouth somebody publicly or been in the news for, said something shady, you have a chance to, um, you know, apologize, but you're not a shady person, so I can't really find my. <laughs> but but I, and nonetheless, I mean, I'm shady. I'm just like. No, you know. oh no, we got some of the shade. We just, cool. <laughs> there weren't names assigned to it. So that's why we're going to do our best to figure out, okay, you said you have not been dragged if you have not been dragged by black Twitter, relentless, okay. So when was the time you were dragged by black Twitter? I just think I was just saying that in general. Oh, just because, like, because it is black, what it is. the bl black Twitter, like, they come up with the most creative disses and like memes and stuff. It is, it, they're unmatched. The gifts attached to it makes it even worse. Unmatched. <laughs> right, okay. All right, the next one. Y'all not saying y'all ABCs while you wash your hands anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to touch things again. Mm hmm. People are getting out, coming out of the bathroom and not, you know, when COVID was happening, they would say, wash your hands and say your ABCs. That's how long you're supposed or to wash, wash your, your hands, hands for two minutes. Yes. They ain't doing that. Nobody's doing that anymore. Okay. Next one. Okay. I'm going back to being weird in private. Enjoy this while it lasts. Oh, I think that's, the, I feel like that's when I started posting stuff about my, my boyfriend. He was my boyfriend at the time. The last one? Yes. And I think. People were just like, girls started sliding in his DMs because of it, and girls started sliding in my DMs and saying, I was like, y'all are weird, bro. Like, I'm not talking about nothing no more on here. And that's why we don't see the new one. No. I mean, you have. I posted him. I posted him on my stories. Yeah, before. but you're not like. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever do that. Y'all not again. sitting in front of a fireplace with like matching pajamas and no, a dog. No, I'm not, not doing that anymore. Okay, yeah, that's smart. Uh, that's out. Uh, <laughs> Learn my lesson. Well, I've been so single that the minute I do find somebody worth buying matching pajamas for, we are going to be matching in front of a fireplace. I think you have to do it. I have to. You have I, to do it. I have to be super gay at least one time yeah. in my life. <laughs> okay, the next one. The person says, it's time to add Miss Amber Riley into this into the R&B is a live talk too. Mm. And you said, oh, thank you. This R&B is dead talk. Is the real tea is the ones who are talking are the same ones who don't support and fund black artists mm -hmm. like they do the white ones. The budgets and the opportunities are not the same. These labels don't think that black sells. Yes. We talked about that. Yeah. I'm not taking back taking back what I said. That I, was a real tweet. Yeah. I mean it. I mean it. All the execs. I, I, I mean it with the producers too. The, these black producers. Um you know, going online and was like, R&B is for every, I forgot which producer, it was a big producer that went online and was like, 
R and B is for everyone. It's not just black people. And I'm like, but it was created by us, and that's the that is what's messing everything up. The conversation of we should gatekeep some things. There's there's no reason that white artists should be making more money off of R and B than black artists. And are. that's the reason why you and K Michelle should do that country album, so that way white people can say, y'all blacks Look need it. to stop singing this white. <laughs> this is pure white country music. Because you know when Beyonce went and did the thing with the oh, Dixie they were chicks, upset. they wanted to stab her in yeah. public. Yeah, they were upset. They were I very for upset. It though. She got up there with them Dixie chicks. Not only did she do a country performance at the at the CMAs. She did a country performance with the white girls who were canceled by trying to cancel the president yep. that they all had canceled. They like, damn, this this black girl done revived these white girls. <laughs> we live for it. We live for it. Okay, the next one. First they laugh, then they copy. Oh, I don't know. What the, what was I talking about? I may have been drunk. First they laugh, then they copy. I mean, yeah. That could kind of apply to a lot of different yeah, things. It really right? can. Mm. I, I thought you were talking, talking about Sam Smith's uh, Grammy performance after he saw Lil Nas X on BET. <laughs> anyway, okay. The next one. <laughs> I despise when people call me Mercedes. Put some respect on my name. Call mm -hmm. me Amber or Riley. It's wild that I even have to say that. No shade to the show character that they gave that gave me a career, but please stop this. Shit. I don't answer to it. And if you do it, is that facetiously? Yeah. I'll block you. I was definitely drunk when I wrote, when I tweeted this, <laughs> and I was on a plane. So when I got off of the plane, I saw all the backlash. <laughs> was, was that like, from the Glee I fans? Know. Okay, no. So let me be let me be very very specific and candid about what that tweet was about. People would use Mercedes. White people specifically would use Mercedes like it was a cuss word. Like, yeah. I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of like how people were going around calling people precious. Yeah. It was the same way that they, any big black girl, um, Mercedes, people were saying it or would say it in a way to, to make it seem like that's the only thing that you've done in your career, Mercedes. Mm. Like it was never really said, I don't mind when people come up, they don't know my name. I'll just be like, oh, I'm Amber. Like, you know, when you introduce yourself or whatever the case may be, that's not where it was really coming mm -hmm. from. It really was from people you know with you know you know my name because it's right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's literally right there when you tweet me. Right. You had to put it in <laughs> and you see it. So that's really that's really what what um where that tweet came from. And another thing with this tweet specifically, I have never sp seen facetiously spelled out. I'm going to use it now. <laughs> Cuz it's like one of those big words that you throw in somebody's face like you're so dumb, I'm going to just throw this big <laughs> word at you. <laughs> Facetiously. No, she's smart. <laughs> okay, next one. I've done too much in my career to be reduced to one role. Whether you respect the work I've done or not, I don't really care. But basic human decency is to recognize me as a person and use my actual name, boundaries. Same. Same thing. Yeah. So what do you think people um, don't understand about you or misunderstand about you? I think... Um... I don't know. I, I I I I feel like I've been pretty. What you see is what you get. So I don't I don't really know if anyone misunderstands. I think I've been more transparent and vulnerable about who I am in the last couple of years because of therapy and not being afraid to really show that. So I don't really think that people misunderstand um, who I am because mm. I think that I'm. I'm pretty much an open book. That's dope. Okay, last game. And we saved the messiest for last. Oh, Jesus. Oh, <laughs> Lord. The next game is called Tea or Tweet. Bring it. Tea or Tweet. <laughs> now, I'm going to see if you're really from Compton. Now, I'm going to see what you really made of. Okay, so Tea or Tweet. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. You can either spill the tea or you have to send out a tweet I tell you to, but you can't tell anybody that I had you do it for at least two days. <laughs> I love it here. Okay. <laughs> ready? No! I'm not ready! <laughs> oh, it's fun. Let me tell you how I treat Twitter. I treat it like Kim Jong-un. I just throw it out there and whatever it blows up, it blows up. And I just, you know, brace for impact. All right. Jesus so you started singing as a ghost singer. Yes. Which is like a ghost writer. Yes. That means that you'll be called in to hit notes 
that artists couldn't imitate or they couldn't do whatever. Mm -hmm. Who used your vocals as theirs? Um, okay, I don't know who it was specifically, uh -huh. to be honest, but I used to do stuff for G-Unit. Really? Yes. G-Unit. Oh, Olivia. I don't, I don't know. Well, that was the Jason Lee Show, <laughs> Amber Riley. There's no erasing the shade. We played that game already. Thank you for coming on. Wait, what are we promoting? We have to promote it because there'll be lots and lots and lots of people oh watching this. Oh my gosh, this. I don't know. I don't know. Go to, wait, hold on, hold on. Go to at Miss Amber P. Riley and thank her for all the success that Olivia or any other G artist may have had. I didn't know there was a such thing as a ghost singer. It is. Really? Yeah, there was a producer that I used to work with and he was like, I just need you to come in and sing these things. I don't know who he, I did not say it was Olivia. I don't know who they used it for. I just know I came in. And I sang what they did, and I got eight hundred dollars for it. So well, we'll put we'll we'll put <laughs> we'll put allegedly, Olivia, because if I remember G Unit, there was no other female artist. I mean, you wasn't doing it for Fifty, you wasn't doing it for Eminem, it was yeah. Well, a lot of aftermath gonna come from that. Well, listen, um, Amber, I appreciate you coming on the show. I've always supported you, and you've always supported me. And yeah. I think that you're a phenomenal talent, but you're an even better human being. Thank you. And, um, you know, shout out to our exes who make way for the future. <laughs> I'll be at that wedding. Bye. Peace yeah. out. I survived, y'all. I survived.